Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. I want to especially just lead with thanking uh, the New School and the Creative uh, Publishing and Critical Journalism Program um, here for their partnership for this and, and other, uh, other events. It was very, very easy. We came in ready to negotiate, and they're like, how can we help you? What do you need? Um, obviously, we need a bigger room, but this will, this will do. Um, and uh, we're here really to celebrate and talk about um, Matt Karp's uh, book. For Jacobin, Matt was really, he's been the gift that keeps on giving. I, I don't know, I've, I know there's so many people who's like, you know, I don't really like Jacobin, but I read all the posts that Matt Karp writes about the book. <laughs> I was just like, that is very mean and insulting to be saying that to me. But, um, but they say that. <laughs> and in a way, we, we've always done kind of a deep entryist project with like the most important sector of the U.S. economy, which is Civil War um, historians. Um, so, a large know, voting block. Right, a very <laughs> large voting block. So we, we put together a special um, issue, which, which Matt had a big part in kind of planning and, and helping us put together uh, last year, and it features a very very uh, long and good interview with Eric Foner. We have some of that issue um, outside. But you know, the reason why we focus on the Civil War in this period is that you know, the Civil War was really one of the most, in any you know, capitalist country all around the world, it was the, very, uh, the largest expropriation of wealth, the, most, the greatest social people that, that we've seen, and, and a very substantial one. So I think you know, next to the, the Bolsheviks, or maybe even greater, the Republican Party. Um, <laughs> and you should ask. Uh, Carl Rove, who actually cites um, um, Eric as one of his favorite um, historians, maybe his favorite uh, historian. <laughs> but we won't, we won't hold, <laughs> hold that against him. Um, so before I kind of um, um, you know, go further with introductions, I just want to point out that this is a book launch. So I have to say that this vast Southern Empire is available outside for $30. Um, you also get a free issue of Jacobin. $30 isn't our price, it's Harvard's price, but it's really good, it's worth it. I sat through and I, I was first trying to like read the introduction and skim it, so I was just going to be a good friend and maybe if it came up in conversation I would have enough to block through, but I actually read uh, every word, so I think you would, you would too. Um, and of course, um, he needs a little introduction, but um, Eric is kind enough to be in conversation with Matt. Um, Eric is, is um, a, a professor um, at uh, Columbia University, the author of many books, including The Fiery Trial and uh, Reconstruction. But uh, I'll leave it there. And anything I'm forgetting? All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, hello to those who are watching this on the uh, streaming on the Jacobin, what, Facebook page or something? Mm -hmm. and well, why? I'm one of those people who reads the actual printed Jacobin. I've never seen any of your posts, because I don't, wouldn't even know how to find them. I, I am totally low-tech, and that is how I write books, actually. I don't spend a lot of time on my computer. But, and I recommend that as a practice to anyone who wants to uh, contribute to uh, intellectual life in this country. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway uh, Matt Karp's book, the vast, This Vast Southern Empire, is, uh, I, I do honestly recommend it. It is very well written. Even if you're not a scholar of American history, you'll find it interesting and engaging and lively. It's very deeply researched. It's um, cleverly ironic at certain points, and we may get into this, and it's quite original, actually, in its, uh, in its uh, argument, and that's not easy to do for a subject that has produced thousands upon thousands of books, the antebellum South, the coming of the Civil War, the role of slavery in American history, so to take a new uh, angle of vision on that is uh, commendable, to say the least. Um, so I'm going to just throw some questions at Matt. It will be sort of like his orals exam when he was a graduate student, and we'll see how he does. And uh, we'll, get into a, we'll get into a discussion of this. Um, I'm going to start right off at, the, at a high level of abstraction and work down to more specific aspects of the book. But you want to... Uh, yeah, just before, before we begin, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming out. I wanted to do a little pro forma, but... Okay. Uh, seriously, I want to thank Jason uh, Bardman for organizing this. Uh, did a lot, a lot of hard work went into this. 
uh, should be acknowledged. I want to thank Bosker. And I want to thank, uh, speaking of labor, I want to thank uh, my mother, who uh, the book is dedicated to, and who uh, decided to take a bus uh, all the way up to New York to hear me talk about like Jefferson Davis for an hour. So, uh, and also, also raised me basically single-handedly. So, uh, thanks to Freddie. Hi, everyone. Uh, we will try to avoid saying anything that may alarm your mother. Um, <laughs> So as you know, Matt, one of the um, cottage industries in the historical profession right now is uh, studying the relationship between capitalism and American slavery. This is an old discussion. It goes way, way back. Karl Marx <laughs> said things about it. Um, Eric Williams wrote about it in the 1940s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering, now that's not exactly the subject of your book, really, but I'm wondering how you think think your study, which is, it, it is, it's a study of slave owners and American foreign policy, although that actually is too narrow. Slaveholders and their vision of America as a great power in the world and an empire in the world. And we'll get into that, but, and it's so, but how do you think this fits into the go, ongoing debates about slavery and capitalism nowadays? He, he wasn't joking, this, this really is like, like an oral question. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well, I think you're right. I mean, I think the book joins, one way to, 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 to think about it is the book joining uh, a whole um, series of works that are exploring the slave South in a kind of uh, transnational sense. I mean, that's another aspect of, of you know, very fashionable uh, word and concept uh, that look at the sort of re-emphasizing the dynamism, um, of also the brutality of, uh, of antebellum slavery. I think a lot of previous works that you know, uh, for instance, Fogel and Engerman write the kind of classic statement about slavery and capitalism, you know, sort of made the argument that slavery was capitalistic, but because slaves were, you know, had a Protestant work ethic and were well treated and so on. And, you know, the, the, the direction of the, the, the modern scholarship is um, also emphasizing slavery as a sort of foundational element in global capitalism and American capitalism, and as, um, uh, but, but not precisely sort of in the opposite direction about its um, you know, it's it's uh, that it's brutality. You know, for someone like Ed Baptist or Walter Johnson, is the source of its dynamism. Um, so my my book definitely, um, I think it's right to put it in conversation with those books. In a way, though, my arguments I think are more modest uh, about um, certainly about the sort of you know the place of slavery in the history of global capitalism. I'm mostly interested in not so much in a kind of um, deep historiographical terms was slavery capitalist, but how did slaveholders understand this institution, and what did, how did their understanding shape the sort of political decisions um, that led to the Civil War? I mean, in, in some sense, or that shaped, you know, American foreign policy. And I think, I do think that, you know, we can talk more about this. I'll, 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 I'll try to be concise, but I think that they, to a, to an extent much greater than uh, a lot of scholars have realized, uh, you know, they really did see slavery not simply as a kind of paternal. Uh, organically constructed institution that provided security from the, um, you know, the tumult of, of modern life or from a wage labor society, but they also saw it as an incredibly, they, they did see it as an incredibly dynamic, world-making, um, uh, productive institution that was very compatible with the modern world. Now, that's, that I'm not necessarily, don't want to swallow their arguments whole cloth, but, because um, uh, I think there are a lot of important ways that they were wrong. But uh, I think we need to take seriously what they believed about the institution. The, the reason I raise this is the, the, the name, that this is my own intellectual background, a different generation, the name that, hmm. <laughs> Nighttime. Who is, uh, is, is this intentional or did the new school not pay its uh, electric bill? All right, there we go. I think Questions I are going to get a lot more instant. Right. No, I think it's uh, actually from the beyond, because I was about to mention the, the historian Eugene Genovese. Mm. And um, that's a name that kept popping up in my mind as I was reading this. It's irrelevant in a way, except that, um, like you, like, like Matt, Genovese portrayed slave owners as intellectually uh, vibrant, politically confident, expansionist in terms of what they thought the future of the institution was going to be. But, on the other hand, his picture of slavery internally is quite different. It, it's not capitalist. It's inherently inefficient, according to him. Um, 
And his view of slavery is that it's a paternalistic institution, etc. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering um, the extent to which your view of the slave owners uh, either does or doesn't draw on Genovese's view. I just raise him because over the decades, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, he was uh, really probably the most influential scholar of slavery, so that anybody writing about this has to at least think about how they fit in relation to his writings. Yeah, I mean, you can't read, you know, even though I think the one major tendency of this new scholarship on slavery and capitalism is that, you know, there's like a parlor game. How far in to the introduction do they get before they, you know, <laughs> did not Genovese directly or indirectly? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think one way that I do think Genovese's com contribution um, remains really important is that he understood slavery, you know, as, as a Marxist, as a, as a political economic system, and slaveholders as a ruling class. They were not to the extent that, and, and, I, and I think that that element of his interpretation holds up, at least in, in, in my portrait, in my understanding of slaveholders, that to the extent that they were capitalists and they were interested in profit and they saw slavery as dynamic and, and, and the source of global um, economic growth, which, which I think they did, they also understood themselves to be in some sense distinct from other capitalists and that this institution was founded on a sort of social system that was based on a certain kind of domination of ownership of humans as property. And I think um, that, that distinction is important and that view of slaveholders as a class uh, is something that we shouldn't lose um, uh, it, despite all of the, 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 the new emphases. I would say, though, that there are some ways that my work definitely diverges. If you want to, I don't know if you want to. Well, no, I don't. It, it, I think uh, it's just important to raise this because any work of history is, in a sense, a commentary on works that have come before it, as well as its own original contribution. Well, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on Genovese. More historiography there. More, no, historiography the is uh, <laughs> fairly boring. Um, but I think um, you know one of the things historians have to struggle to uh, overcome is the very fact that we know what happened and the people at the time didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and one of the things I think that's a great strength of Matt's book is he understands that these people didn't know they were living in the pre-Civil War period, right? right. right. <laughs> they, they were not looking to a violent conflict which would destroy slavery. They were they didn't think, they were confident, they were internationalist minded, they, um, they had a vision of American greatness with slavery at the center of it, and even more to the point, it's, it's impossible for us to get back into the frame of mind before the Civil War where slavery was actually growing, expanding, you know, it's so easy to think the end of slavery was inevitable. How could it, it certainly couldn't exist today, right? Uh, it had to be gotten rid of, and so people must have realized that they were on the eve of the end, but they didn't think that way at all, right? I mean, what's interesting is, you know, some of the, the, the rhetoric of slavery facing its inevitable doom comes from the Republican Party. I mean, this is a rhetorical trope, they call it, you know, in the 1856-60 platform, right, a, a relic of barbarism. Right. And, you know, if you read someone like William Seward, there's this incredible confidence that, the, you know, the free labor economy is so much more dynamic and will swallow up. Um, the slave economy. But I mean, I think if you really look at this in just real terms in 1860, there's a considerable extent to which these guys are bluffing. Because slavery as a, uh, not just, uh, and not just uh, the American export of cotton is obviously, you know, fundamental to the British Industrial Revolution, but I mean, slaveholders are also pointing out uh, Brazilian um, coffee exports, uh, uh, Cuban sugar exports. All across this period between 1840 and 1860, they're spiking and increasingly dominating the world market. Now, there are reasons that we shouldn't think that this means that slavery was impregnable, that you know that it was going to last forever, if it, if, in, in forever and ever and ever. But in this specific moment of the 1850s, I think there is a lot. There are a lot of numbers on the slaveholder side, and the Republican confidence about its doom is. I think often, um, often a bluff that we, we, we shouldn't take literally. Well, they talked about its doom, but as Lincoln said, it might last a hundred more years. <laughs> it's doom, but it's got a long, you know, maybe a way in the future. Um, one of the advantages of the kind of internationalist perspective that Matt talked about in the book is that it does 
make you realize that slavery was expanding not only in the U.S., but in Brazil and in Cuba. Those were the three great slave societies of the middle of the 19th century. And here's a, a useful little fact I will just throw out there. In 1860, on the eve of the American Civil War, there were more slaves in the Western Hemisphere than at any other point in history. Slavery was not going away, it was not dying out, even though it had been abolished in Haiti, of course, by revolution, in the British Empire, in the Latin American nations which had rebelled against Spain, it was still dynamic and growing. And so that was the frame of mind that these southern slaveholders that you talk about sort of brought into this period. There's a character in the book, um, uh, Senator from Virginia, who's the chairman of the Finance Committee for across the 1850s, one of the most powerful guys in Washington. He's kind of um, been buried, uh, lost in, in the sands of time. Robert Mercer, Tolliver Hunter, he had one of these great quadruple barrel antebellum southern names. Um, he, uh, he gave a speech at one point, I think it was in 1850, about the conference where he says, you know, he sort of does a thought experiment. Imagine if slavery had been abolished everywhere at the time of British abolition. Imagine if, you know, uh, in the United States, in Brazil, in Cuba, in, uh, in all the colonies of the world. And he says, you know, imagine this, no cotton, no sugar, little coffee, but less tobacco. I mean, he makes the world sound really bleak without slavery. And, I mean, you know, this is, uh, the, uh, he's speaking to, to um, uh, this, I mean, he's this sort of um, rumpled, con, you know, conservative, you know, country, countryside uh, uh, born uh, Virginian, but he has this global perspective. Um, and I think that global perspective really enforces their confidence about slavery's place internationally at the heart of the world economy, that all these industrializing societies are just buying more and more slave goods, and they're outpacing um, the, the emancipated societies, which are uh, less productive from a pure export uh, perspective because they're not coercing the workers. The, one of the interesting things you talk about, maybe you want to say a word or two about this, is that is the sort of intellectual world of the 1850s was one in which scientific racism was very rapidly, you know, gaining a hold on, in, you know, enlightened thought and uh, the, the, the pseudoscience of craniology and all this. So the notion that races were, that human beings were divided into groups called races and some of them were superior and some of them were inferior was more powerful in this period than it had been 30 or 40 years before. Yeah, I mean, I think we one, one, one thing we don't appreciate enough is the extent to which the intellectual currents of the kind of brightest minds of Western civilization across the 19th century were moving away from equality, were moving away from a sense of uh, belief in human, uh, basic human biological equality. The Republican Party, in some sense, is fighting into a headwind uh, against, against Harvard, against Oxford and Cambridge, against the Sorbonne. All of these... Um, uh, I mean, yeah, there are some of the sort of more famous, um, you know, a slightly more cuckoo, uh, you know, southern slave doctors who are doing weird experiments on, on lungs and stuff like that. But the, the intellectual pedigree of this kind of scientific racism was actually growing and continued to grow across the late 19th century. And, um, you know, people like Louis Agassiz at Harvard, you know, the most eminent scientist in America, is you know, uh, in effect, you know, Southerners are claiming him as somebody who support, you know, pro-slavery writers are claiming as someone who supports their position about human fundamental inequality. And I think, again, this is, you know, I think it's hard to square that kind of dark movement towards, um, you know, I mean, it, it really peaks in the, probably around the turn of the century, I would say, or maybe even the early 20th century, this kind of, um, you know, scientific racism. And that it's beginning in this period, the Republican parties, um, the anti-slavery movement in general is, is, in some sense, moving against the grain intellectually. Um, right. Now, so the book is, I'm going to get now into a couple more details about the The book is really about slave owners, how they tried to shape American foreign policy, what their aims were, looking into the future about America as a great power with slavery. Um, it, it includes some very well-known people like Jefferson Davis and quite a few like Hunter or others who probably very few people have heard of. For example, how many people in this room have heard of Abel Upshur? All right, we got a few <laughs> fanatics here. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a, tell us about Abel Upshur. Now, most people don't consider him that 
significant a figure in American history, but you do. I was at a, I was at a bar in D.C. Uh, just on Upshur Avenue the other day. Really? Or so right. Upshur Street, maybe. There's there's a whole kind of like um, pro-slavery set of blocks in D.C. Like Buchanan, uh, Upshur, uh, I don't know, whatever. Um, yeah, P- I don't know. They're all like piled up uh, so who, there. So who was this guy? Uh, Abel Upshur was a Virginia jurist, legal scholar who actually... I think I said in the book, he, got, he actually got kicked out of Princeton for like inciting like a drunken student riot in 1807. And then he sets up shop in sort of um, eastern uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. And uh, he's a planter and he writes, you know, uh, sort of very vigorous Calhoun style um, uh, states' rights interpretations of the Constitution and so on. But in, in 1840, um, uh, in 1841, after um, uh, William Henry Harrison dies, uh, the new Whig president, and John Tyler steps into office right away, who, um, you know, this is, this is an interesting, you know, twist in American history to some extent, because, you know, Harrison was a, a sort of an unknown quantity, um, who was elected as his first Whig president, this kind of uh, big void, but his, his vice president, Tyler, the first vice president to take over, was a really committed... Um, Virginia uh, Southern rights pro-slavery ideologue and he, he starts packing his cabinet with people who look the same way at, at the world I mean it's you know you can make some parallels but he uh, you know as, as, as when he becomes president and he uh, Abel Upshur comes out of nowhere to become um, the secretary of the Navy he doesn't have much experience maritime uh, experience of note but um, but he's a support he's Tyler's buddy and all of a sudden, overnight, he wants to, you know, his first secretary, his report as secretary of the Navy is, um, uh, he demands like an eight, eight-fold increase in uh, the Navy to make it this half the size of Great Britain. Uh, and why is he doing this? It seems to fly in the face of a lot of sort of states' rights, small government philosophy. Uh, but uh, in his view, uh, the abolitionist power of Great Britain demands a U.S. federal government response, not just, you know, the state of Virginia can't fight off uh, the global power of the you know anti-slavery empire of Great Britain, uh, the United States needs to do it. And fortunately, you know, the, the slaveholders are president of the United States, and you know his cabinet is full of slaveholders. So you know, let's do that. And uh, they, you know, they don't get this giant navy. Actually, there's you know things grind up in, in in Congress, but they you know they they get some increases, they get some reorganizations, they get some reforms. What's striking is that they were even trying, and I think it says something about the intellectual orientation, the ideological orientation of this, um, uh, you know, sort of states' rights, southern uh, planter class that, uh, that that they were, you know, the, the, really the strongest advocates for naval power for uh, Jefferson Davis as Secretary of War in the fifties. Same thing for military power uh, across this this Annabelle period. So the, that is very important because the, the in other words these pro southern pro slavery southern statesmen are not afraid of a powerful federal government. They they talk about states' rights when that um, when that is in the interest of slavery, but they also think as long as they're in control, a powerful federal government is a very useful thing, right? Right. I mean the, the classic example and you you've written about this is the fugitive slave law, right? right. Which is right. you know pretty much every incident. Every, um, you know, every, every time slavery and states' rights are in tension, it's not a surprise that these guys want a powerful federal government to defend slave property, and, you know, to protect against fugitive slaves, which, and, you know, the northern states after 1850 are, you know, or before 1850 really were passing these, you know, personal liberty laws to sort of use states' rights to protect fugitive slaves, or at least to make sure that fugitive slaves had, you know, due process and so on, and the southerners have no problem empowering the federal government there. I do kind of argue even beyond that, though, because it's not just about, I think, protecting sort of their narrow property rights, which are, which are fundamental, but it's about protecting, um, I think, uh, their concept of pro-slavery, of the United States of pro-slavery power extends beyond that in terms of rebutting on ideological and on a strategic level um, anti-slavery forces around the world, whether they be Britain, whether they be uh, Haiti, whether they be you know, rebellious slaves anywhere. Right, right. So um, I, I just want to go back to Upshaw for a minute. Um, uh, tell us wh- uh, what, what happened to Upshaw in the end. Uh, it's one of the more um, <laughs> yeah. uh, unusual uh, departures yeah. in American history. It was an, an explosive end. Yeah, he, um, he, uh, he's, he's signing, he's writing up the sort of uh, final annexation of Texas Treaty because he's a big, 
you know, uh, he's a, sort of the original architect of Texas annexation too. Um, uh, and meanwhile, there's a, a there's a new ship called called uh, interestingly enough the Princeton, uh, one of his sort of new steamships that has been put into commission um, uh, at, in, during his tenure as Secretary of Navy. It's like you know it's sort of ironic and. There, you know, everybody, the Congress, the Tyler administration invites all of Congress and, you know, various dignitaries to come aboard the ship and enjoy, uh, I think the one of the newspapers described it as a, a sumptuous collation of, like, cured meats and, you know, whatever, various kinds of, you know, probably gross stuff that, you know, were considered delicacies in 1840, uh, in 1844, or 1844. And, um, uh, yeah, they, they're like, hey, you know, look, this ship has some big guns on it. Let, let's fire some of these guns. <laughs> like, we're here, we're drinking, we're eating, let's fire, this is a cool new steam shit. Let's fire some guns. So they fire, there's a big gun called the Peacemaker. And they, so they fire it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's right, this is deep in the American grain, right? The Peacemaker. So they, they fire the Peacemaker once, you know, uh, what do you do? And then, you know, they're, they're, they're continuing to fire it. Then, you know, they take a break, they drink some more. John Tyler is in the, the ship's hold. He's uh, downstairs with, with, the, with the food and the drink. He's actually talking to, his wife has just died, and he's talking to this 19-year-old uh, daughter of uh, a rich New York businessman who he would later marry, the, you know, one of these marriages of November and June or whatever. Um, the old, one of the few presidents, is he the only president to get married in the White House? I don't, uh, I don't know. The anyway, he, 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 so he's talking to her. Uh, her father is up on the deck, David Gardner, with, this, sorry, I'm going really into detail here, but this is a great moment, with Abel Upshur, with Thomas Hart Benton, who's a, you know, a Missouri senator, with a bunch of other folks, uh, and they're like, oh, come on, let's just fire the gun one more time. We need this. And uh, they fire the gun, it, it totally blows up, and it spews hot iron across the deck. I mean, it's, I guess it's just not funny, um, but it's, uh, Upshur's Secretary of State is killed, uh, the new, his replacement as Secretary of Navy, uh, Thomas Walker Gilmore of Virginia, another one of these guys in this cohort, is killed. Um, uh, the very, a variety of other, I think, uh, this one enslaved person is killed. Uh, I think it's about eight total. Um, and I think it's the only incident in American history where we had two cabinet members, um, you know, dying, in effect, in, in, in the line of duty, if you can call it that, um, <laughs> at, at one time, or any cabinet member, but this, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of catastrophic moment, and then, and then of course, you know, what does Tyler do? He's, he was safe downstairs. He appoints John C. Calhoun as Secretary of State. So. Right, okay, so that's the end of Upshur, and um, yeah. uh, John C. Calhoun, and that leads to the annexation of Texas, which you call the quintessential achievement of the foreign policy of slavery. Now, Texas was a slave area, but why is this so important to Southerners to get Texas, which had been independent for eight years after the rebe it rebelled against Mexico. Why is it so important to Southerners to get Texas into the American Union? Well, we, we, we like to think about Texas, I think, uh, when, to the extent that we think about Texas joining the nation as part of this kind of inevitable process of Western expansion or whatever. It's like, there was California and, and you know, and well, there, you know, there was there was Texas and then there was the Mexican War, so it was California and then there, were, and there was Oregon happened in there and all of these other sort of states that get added to the Union by various forms of conquest or negotiation in the 1840s. Um, but uh, Texas is a very different place than any of these other any of the, uh, these other situations because Texas is an independent republic and an independent slaveholding republic. And I think from the perspective, the strategic perspective of these Southerners, it really belongs alongside Cuba and alongside Brazil. It's the fourth largest slaveholding uh, society in the, you know, Cuba's not a republic, in, in Brazil's not a republic. Fourth largest slaveholding society in the hemisphere at this point. And it's, it's one that is under a lot of stress from Great Britain, which, you know, is not really that interested in trying to abolitionize Texas, but they're toying with it. Um, you know, Mexico, which is, you know, in which slave slavery is outlawed in Mexico, is constantly fighting border wars with Texas, and neither one can really defeat the other, but, um, you know, Texas is sort of under siege. A lot of the slaveholders there are concerned. Most of them want to be annexed to sort of join the American Republic for, you know, geopolitical reasons, but also to protect slave property. And from a Southern perspective, yeah, it's absolutely essential. I think it's important that we see this not just as a moment of American expansion, but as a moment of kind of slave power consolidation. Um, they, they literally talk in those terms about the you know the slave power in North America should be um, you know should have one headquarters, not not more than one. And I, I think that's how we should look at it. 
Yeah, yeah, and then as you say, and then Calhoun as Secretary of State and Tyler as President get Texas in. My position is that Texas was not legally annexed, right? Because it was supposed to be, uh, it needed a two-thirds vote of the Senate to approve this treaty, but they didn't get it, so they just no passed. Treaty. They just passed a resolution by yeah. a majority vote. So my position Barely. is. Texas is not actually part of the United States, <laughs> and, um, and sh its votes should not be counted in any election, <laughs> and um, things like that. But anyway, but uh, this uh, this illuminates a, a theme that runs through the book about the sort of interaction between the U.S. and particularly the slave owners and Great Britain. On the one hand, they're kind of afraid of Great Britain, as you say, uh, Britain's a big, powerful country. On the other hand. They're annoyed at Britain because, rhetorically at least, it is promoting the abolition of slavery. What are the, you know, what kind of relations with Great Britain do they want the United States to have? It's complicated because, yeah, I mean, uh, I think in the interview I did with uh, Connor Kilpatrick, uh, shout out to Connor here, uh, that was up on Jacobin today. You know, it, it, he, he says, you know, at one point in the book I analogize it to a kind of Cold War in the sense that, you know, which some people push back against that. I'm not super committed to it, but in the sense that there's an ideological and a strategic conflict between the United States, which is, you know, at this point run by slaveholders, and Britain, which is at least formally committed to anti-slavery and to a free labor, you know, world market, uh, that's right. And, but I think that the difference is um, that slaveholders, as much as they're opposed to Britain, as much as they want to build up the Navy to sort of contest the power of Great Britain, annex Texas, do all sorts of stuff, build relationships with Cuba and Brazil. Um, they also don't see Britain as kind of in inevitably, implacably opposed to uh, slavery. They think that if we can just sort of convince the British capitalist elites, you know, some of whom are already probably close to seeing the world that we, the way we do, that emanci an emancipated society, free labor, is never going to produce tropical staples at the same rate as a slave society. And that this is going to be, you know, an abolition of slavery would be disastrous for business. Um, that, uh, you know, we can actually work, get along pretty well with uh, the sort of British mercantile class, with the British, um, the, you know, the British government. And in the 1850s, that's sort of how they, they, they basically feel like, you know, the annexation of Texas, the war with Mexico, Britain has kind of stepped back from trying to enforce the balance of power in the British, in, the, in, the, in, the North, in, the, in North America. You know, the United States has kind of become the dominant continental power. And economically, Britain has dialed back a little bit of its anti-slavery, um, uh, uh, both its rhetoric and its kind of anti-slavery pressure. And they're sort of, Southerners are like kind of claiming victory. Calhoun gives a speech where he says, you know, we basically won this war of ideas uh, with Britain, and they're now committed to free trade, which means we're, they're not trying to do any kind of protections to protect their emancipated colonies from competition with slavery. You know, uh, these slave states can produce goods cheaper, better, faster, and they're just gonna buy our cotton and Cuban sugar, not Jamaican sugar, uh, that's produced by, you know, by free labor. Uh, and that shows that they're willing to work with us, they can deal with us, and then by 1860, they're, of course, they're looking to them as an ally. One question I had uh, about, what, what you make a point uh, here and there in the book that even that the slave, even though they want the United States to be a big power and they want to build up the navy and the army, um, they don't really want to have a war because they're they're afraid of what slaves might do if there is a war, as happened in the American Revolution, for example, and the War of eighteen twelve. Um, so, how important is that? You know, fear yeah. of in, an internal danger. Yeah, they're not dummies, and they, you know, they sometimes, you know, are, you know, sort of indulgent bravado about, you know, the only great military powers in world history were slave powers. You know, Greece and Rome conquered the world with, as, you know, slave powers and so on. But I think, really, when push comes to shove, they know that a war with an anti-slavery power, uh, a, a strong anti-slavery power like Britain, could be totally catastrophic and disastrous to their, not just to them, Strategically or militarily, but to their social system, because you know they're always talking about these, you know, uh, British Britain landing troops from West in from from uh, Jamaica, the West Indian troops, you know, black troops, which uh, you know which are garrisoned in the West Indies, and if they, you know, they they're they're very aware that if these soldiers show up in Louisiana or uh, or Florida or somewhere, that you know they could arm the slaves, and you're going to have a servile insurrection, as Andrew Jackson says. Uh, I mean, you know, the irony, right, is, as, as we said, as said in this interview with Connor, 
Uh, that's exactly what happens in the 1860s. You know, there's, you know, Steve Hahn says this is the greatest slave rebellion in modern history, and it's triggered by the Union Army and by black soldiers, in significant part, uh, marching through these, uh, uh, you know, slave plantation areas. So they were right, and I think, um, you know, they were, they were, uh, they, they really did try to avoid uh, sort of a shooting war with Britain across this whole period. Well, that sort of leads to the, uh, of, I suppose, inevitable question of, um, well, why, do, how did they screw up so badly by uh, seceding from the Union and getting themselves into exactly the kind of war they were afraid of, you know, uh, of happening? Now, of course, we, they didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but there were plenty of people in the South who warned exactly against secession for this very reason. Um, and even though your book is not about the causes of the Civil War, but um, any book on the 1840s and 50s is going to have to have that in the back of one's mind, um, there, to slightly oversimplify, I think there are 20,000 books about this, but two different point, two points of view, and that's about it. <laughs> One is it was an irrepressible conflict, an inevitable conflict between a free labor society and a slave labor society, and the other is, no, it was a blundering generation, it was just mistakes, it was fanaticism, and it was a needless war which they just kind of stumbled into by mistake. Uh, where does this book kind of lead us in thinking about the decision of these very forward-looking, rational, optimistic people to commit suicide. <laughs> We're back in the orals exam. Right, exactly. Um, I think, I mean, fundamentally, I'm in sympathy with the irrepressible conflict thesis, you know, thesis or way to approach this as a, as a conflict between two fundamentally different uh, political economic systems. But I have a little bit of, I guess, I, I had not ever thought about it this way, but I have a little blundering generation in me right. in the sense that I do think that you know, if we take stock of all this new work on slavery's dynamism and power and entrenchment in the American state and the world economy, I do think it makes the anti-slavery movement uh, look more strange and more unlikely and more radical. And I think there has to be an element of contingency or at least that, that, that this was the product of an anti-slavery struggle that was not inevitably fated to sort of stamp, you know, maybe a conflict was inevitable, but the particular form that this conflict took um, with a sort of anti-slavery Republican power winning an election and taking control of the state, and then these slaveholders, uh, you know, aggressively, um, 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 so see, you know, first the, the, the anti-slavery power taking control of the state, refusing to compromise on pretty much anything that the slaveholders wanted about extending slavery. Um, and then the slaveholders responding to that, not by knuckling under, but by, uh, you know, setting up their own kingdom, in effect. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways it could have gone there, and I do think that the the conflict was irrepressible, but I think the form that it took was dependent on not just leaders and individual sort of decision making, but on the sort of the nature of the movements and the ideologies of the of the of the of the, of the you know, political classes in charge in this moment. Uh, I, I yes, I think one has to somehow get our mind, wrap our mind around the idea that these people thought they were going to win. They did not do this as, out of desperation. They didn't do it thinking that they would face destruction. They thought slavery, you know, no power on cotton is king. No power on earth can make war on cotton, as Hammond said. Um, they, um, they really thought they would not take over the American state, but establish their own independence. And then, as you show, they're thinking of other areas like acquiring Cuba, acquiring part of Mexico. Yeah, I mean, there's a way in which I think we do, uh, again, to go back to the interview today, but I, uh, maybe to expand on some things that I said there, uh, there's a way in which we kind of caricature these, this, this slaveholding ruling class in part because they're attached to this institution that we now, you know, of course, regard as barbaric and as, as you, know, it, it, you know, entirely beyond the pale, and uh, because they were so you know, resolutely defeated, uh, you know, at least on, on the battlefield and, you know, in the Reconstruction period um, to an extent. Uh, that we regard them as a kind of, you know, the, the, what's the common word for the most aggressive pro-slavery Southerner as a fire eater, right? As a kind of almost like a circus performer 
uh, quality to it, that these people were sort of apt to fly off the handle and say, oh, well, we lost the election, you know, goddamn, we're, we're going home. You know, the, 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 I think we underestimate the sort of coolness and the calculation and the sort of, um, you know, the, they, they made it obviously a disastrous miscalculation, but I think it's wrong to not view what they were doing as a calculation. Um, you know, when Frederick Douglass heard uh, Steve, Alexander Stevens' farewell speech from uh, Congress, where he gives this long, kind of extended, it's, a, it's a basically the cornerstone speech that he gave two years later. He gives it when he's leaving Congress about the future of slavery and about the world economy being dependent on you know, black inferiority and black labor and white supremacy and uh, the, you know, et cetera. Slavery is this greatest material interest in the world. Um, you know, but Douglas doesn't say he's a fire eater. He says he describes him as you know, cool, thoughtful, he talks about the tranquility of tyrants, you know, and I think that's actually, I prefer if we use that phrase or that mentality to, to think about how these people operated. Not that they were, you know, not error prone, um, but I think we, we need to give them the kind of, you know, uh, in a way, perverse way, maybe the respect of um, being uh, cool, calculating actors on the world stage who really did think that the intellectual, the ideological, the economic, you know, winds were at their back in this period and the world would justify that. We, we are going to uh, stop this portion of shortly, shortly the, the, of, of this and move on to question and answer, but I want to ask one more question to Matt, which is one of the interesting things about the book is it begins and ends not in this time period, but with the commencement address at Harvard in 1890 given by W.E.B. Du Bois as a very young 22-year-old 22, 22 Harvard graduate. And what Du Bois chose to talk about was not Frederick Douglass, was not the abolition of slavery, Lincoln. It was about Jefferson Davis. He gave a talk about Jefferson Davis. Why do you begin and end with Du Bois's lecture on Jefferson Davis? What are we supposed to sort of get from that? Yeah, it's kind of an incredible moment. Um, you know, this like 22-year-old, he's the first African-American, obviously, to give a commencement, a commencement address at Harvard. Um, you know, there's an interesting story there, backstory there. Uh, and he gets up on the stage in the middle of all these Cabots and Lowell's and Adam, John Quincy Adams is and all these New England Brahmins. And he says, you know, your civilization is based, is, is not based on... Uh, John Quincy Adams is based on Jefferson Davis. You know, the, the, the lecture is called Jefferson Davis as a representative of civilization. And he says, you know, if you look, and, and it's not an argument about, um, you know, the memory of the Civil War. Even. It's not an argument about uh, reconciliation and white supremacy. I mean, that's in there about, you know, Confederate memorials and so on that, you know, David Blight has written about. It's not that argument. It's a global argument. It's about, um, you know, European imperialism in Africa. It's about um, the sort of the rule of the the the, the, what is it, the, cool, the, the the rule of the strong over the weak, the cool logic of the club, the rod of empire. I mean, he's got all these great phrases, and he says this stuff comes. You know, he wants to draw the straight line from Jefferson Davis and the slave power to this colonial, um, you know, uh, white supremacy. You know, strong states based in white supremacy that are doing extractive, you know, dependent on extractive labor in colonial societies. Okay, and is he right as a historian? Is there a straight line? Like, you know, it's complicated. You know, I think, you know, you could you could pick it apart a little bit and say, actually, all this stuff was done by people who claimed to have, you know, who were anti-slavery and that capitals had moved on. And, you know, Sven Becker has written about that. But I think where he's right uh, fundamentally is that we shouldn't write these people out of history. We shouldn't write these the, the Davises and the Calhouns and the, and the Stevenses. We should take seriously the, the tranquility of tyrants and their, um, the ways in which some aspects of their vision, even though not the way that they foresaw it, but some aspects of that sort of uh, upsetting vision uh, based on domination uh, really did have an enormous impact on the 20th century. I think you're uh, not giving Du Bois quite enough credit there, okay. actually, for what he's also saying, which uh, has a, uh, maybe, I hate to say, a resonance right at this moment. He's, true, you know, true. he's saying, look, if you want to really understand America, don't look at Abraham Lincoln. Look at Jefferson Davis. Right. You know, this is the, don't talk about all the great ideals of liberty and equality. Let's, you know, look at the ground and what, how people actually are living and how, what, is, what the policies of the country are. 
And uh, the, Jefferson Davis was not an aberration. Jefferson Davis was a representative of American life. Right. And Absolutely. That was a pretty radical thing to say at Harvard. Absolutely. Exactly. 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 I mean, exactly. Pretty, pretty, pretty astonishing. But um, but it's, it's, it's a long line. It's like it's like five pages. Everyone, you know, read my don't don't read, don't read my book. Go read that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great it's a great beginning and end to the book. So listen, I want to. Uh, thank uh, Matt Koff for taking all these uh, all these questions and discussing the book, and uh, we're going to end the this part of the uh, event right this second. But uh, so thank you, Matt. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one final I don't think the boys had anything to say about that. But we are now going to move for a little while into questions.